Good morning, everyone. It's time for us to get started with our Q&A tonight. Thank you all for being a part of these studies. Really do appreciate it. Uh, these opportunities to study God's Word and to grow. I uh, hope they benefit you all as much as they benefit me. Uh, most of us on here, all of us on here, we've been on here before. We know the, uh, we know the routine. We're just going to keep our mics muted in, unless we are speaking because uh, these uh, sessions are being recorded. Uh, are there any prayer requests before we get started tonight from any of you brothers, any, any sisters, any prayer requests? Yeah, just keep my family in prayer. Okay, sure will, Brother Coffee. Definitely will, my brother. Stay strong. You and Sister Coffee and your whole family, your children, and all of us. We'll pray for all of our families. Uh, anybody else? Anything else? Okay, let's pray. All right. God, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for another opportunity, Father, uh, to be in the land of the living, to have the health and strength that we have. We understand that, Father, all good and perfect gifts come from you. Uh, without you, we're nothing. With you, dear God, we're everything. Thank you, Father, for the gospel, uh, which has the power to change lives. If we'll be obedient to it, apply to our lives, and live thereby. Dear God, we know that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Uh, there is a place that Jesus has left to prepare where he rules and reigns, uh, that we will be with him forever in his presence. If we just continue to hold on, uh, put our hand to the plow, keep it there, and not look back. Pray, dear Father, that everyone on this Zoom study, Father God, uh, who made efforts to be here, that Father will live lives that are, that are productive, that we might be prepared. Uh, whenever, Father, you send your son Jesus back. Father, we ask now, as we look at ourselves, we ask you, to Father, as well, to search us. If there be anything, Father, that we've said, thought, done, that's contrary to your will, we ask, dear Father, as you see the godly sorrow, that you would remove it, that you would not hold it against us, Father. And, Father God, the blood of your son would cleanse us. And we thank you for this avenue. Thank you, Jesus, for being an intercessor. Thank you, Spirit, for interceding as well. Uh, who's in touch with our infirmities and feelings. We don't always do what's right. We strive to do so, dear God. And Father, when we do err, we pray that our hearts are convicted and that Father will have hearts that are repentative and we'll make the necessary changes. And I pray that we will not allow the devil, Satan, to keep throwing up our past to hinder our future. Pray that we'll continue to look ahead and Father, press on to the mark of the high calling that's in Christ Jesus. We love you, Father, and we thank you for your word, your revealed word that guides us in all truth. And I pray to Father for Brother Coffee and his family and the things that he's dealing with that he's requested tonight. You know all about him. You know what's going on in his home, and not only his, but in my home and all homes. And to God, we just invoke your presence there. And then mostly and mainly, we invoke your presence in our heart. And Father, we know if we keep our mind on you, dear God, you'll always keep your mind on us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, brothers, sisters, we're in 1 Corinthians 7. I want to look at a verse from here, and then I'll tell you the question I want to deal with on tonight from 1 Corinthians 7 and verse number 7. What Paul writes in this verse, he says, For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man had his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I want to hone in on that part where he says, but every man had his proper gift of God. Because uh, there are people that will ask this question, how can God be no respecter of person and give gifts to his children? How can God be a no respecter of person and give gifts to his children? Now, there are some people that advocate that, you know, based upon the gifts that God distributed to man, that in the way he distributed the gifts, that he is, in fact, a respecter person. And if he's handing out gifts and people are getting different gifts, then God must be a respecter of person because we all don't have the same gift. And let's see what the Bible says on that. I want you to go back to Deuteronomy 10. The Bible often speaks about, uh, and often speaks about being, not being a respecter of person. And we see that uh, throughout the scripture. Even under the law of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 10, we'll go back there. And uh, Brother Coffee, you're in a position to read? I'll get some of y'all to read so we can make this interactive tonight. A few of us on here. I want you to just read one verse under the law of Moses. Read Deuteronomy chapter 10 and read verse number 17, if you don't mind. Deuteronomy 10. And okay. Uh, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which 
uh, which uh, regardeth not uh, persons nor taketh reward. Can you hear you, brother? Well, Mike is muted. I'm sorry, thank you. This scripture here tells <clears throat> us that God is not a respecter of persons, okay? God himself is not a respecter of persons. Uh, Moses actually uh, iterates that here in the verse that Brother Coffee has just read. And so because God is not a respecter of person, you and I should be a respecter of person as well. Go to Deuteronomy 16 and verse number 19. Uh, Brother Donald, you're in a position to read uh, Deuteronomy, if you have your Bible with you, Deuteronomy 16 and verse 19. I want you to read that one verse for us here because this is, and, and as he turned there, the, this verse he's about to read in the context is the law of Moses when it deals with appointing judges and officers in position. This is the attitude that God wanted these judges to have. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 19. Thou shalt not rest judgment, thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. For a gift do it blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. Okay, thank you for that, my brother. So when it talks about God not showing partiality, and he doesn't, and we not showing partiality, it has to do with applying God's laws. Okay? When it comes to applying God's laws, you are not allowed to show partiality and to be a respecter of persons when it comes to that. And so you can't allow a person's status uh, uh, in society, uh, their personal wealth, or even be bribed to change God's laws. And so when it talks about here in this context of being a respecter of person, when it comes to God's law, you and I cannot be a respecter of, of persons. God's law applies to everybody. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 19. 2 Chronicles chapter 19. Remember Jehoshaphat? Jehoshaphat is king of Judah. And Jehoshaphat is going to appoint judges. And of course, if he's king of Judah, he has God's law. And we just read, Brother Donald just read God's law uh, to judges that they are not to be a respecter of person when it comes to distributing God's laws. In 2 Chronicles chapter 19, uh, Jehoshaphat, uh, who is the judge, he's talking to, this, to these judges that he's about to put uh, in position because uh, they had not been in position for a, a long time. And so, uh, Sister Hernandez, can you read... If you don't mind, 2 Chronicles chapter 19, and I want you to read verse number, start with verse number 5 and read through verse 7 for me. 2 Chronicles 19, and start at verse number 5 through 7. And while she turns there and get that, just remember the context here uh, is Jehoshaphat setting judges up uh, in Judah, in Jerusalem. I look in 2 Chronicles 19 and verse Five to and seven, right? Uh, You're correct. Uh -huh. Wherefore, now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is not iniquity, iniquity with the Lord our God, not respect a person, not taken of gifts. Moreover, in Jerusalem, this Jehoshaphat set of the Levites and of the priests and of the chief or the fathers of Israel for the judgment of the Lord and for the contra and for the controversies when they return to Jerusalem. Okay, thank you. I want you to hone in on verse seven. Go back up to verse seven of Second Chronicles nineteen. He says, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Notice he said, Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord, uh, with the Lord our God, nor respecter of persons, nor taking gifts. And this is Jehoshaphat talking to the judges there, okay? And so when it comes to respecter of persons to God's law, God says you can't be a respecter of persons, okay? Uh, go to Job, Job chapter 34. Remember Elihu, the youngest uh, of the three men, of the four actually, that spoke to Job uh, during, his, during his calamity? Uh, in Job chapter 34, I want you to listen here, beginning at verse number 16. Job, Job 
uh, chapter 34, beginning at verse 16. And Brother Green, I'll get you to read that if you don't mind. Job 34, 16. And while he turns there, I want you to listen to what uh, Elihu says to Job, who had gotten to a point to where he was actually questioning God and, and questioning the things that he was going through. Job 34, beginning at verse 16. Do I keep going? Yeah, 16. Yeah, I want you to read verse. Did you read it all 16 through 19? Because we can barely hear you. Verse 16. Uh, verse 17. It says, Shall even he that hated right govern, and with uh, thou condemn him that is most just? Is it fit to say to, to a king, Thou art wicked, and to princes, Ye are ungodly, how much less to him that accepteth not the person of princes, nor regard the rich more than the poor, but they all are the work of his hands? Okay, so a lot of there is letting Job know, you know, to question these uh, uh, physical rules of this land. You know, and the question, God, you know, you have to understand something about God. God is not a, he's not a respecter of person. He looks at the rich and he judges the poor a lot. It's simply what Allahu is telling, is, is telling Job, okay? I want you to go to the New Testament now. Matthew chapter 22. You remember, and we've been studying Matthew on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but you remember it was an account where the Pharisees were actually tempting, the Pharisees were actually tempting Jesus uh, in Matthew chapter 22, and they, they get the Herodians together with them in Matthew chapter 22. And I want you to look with me, if you'd be so kind, in verse number 15. Listen at this, Matthew 22 and verse number 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto them their disciples with their Herodians, saying, Master, we know that you are true, and you teach the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou, get this, for any man, for you regard us not the person of man. Now, even though their motives are wrong for coming to Jesus, one thing they knew about Jesus is Jesus didn't care about the special interest groups. Jesus didn't care whether you were a Pharisee, a, a Sadducee, a Herodian. What they knew and what they said about Jesus is when it came to God's law, he shot from the hip. He told it like it was, and he was not afraid like everybody else was. So one thing they knew when they came to Jesus is that, that when it comes to what God wants you to say and what God wants you to teach, they knew that Jesus was not a respecter of persons, okay? He's not a respecter of persons when it comes to God's law. So when the Bible says, you know, God is not a respecter of persons, it's talking in that regard when it comes to the law. And God's law and how we are to teach it and how it's to be distributed. And it's also talking about it when it comes to the plan of salvation. When you could Mike meeting Brother Stevenson. Acts chapter 10. Can you, I'm sorry. Can y'all hear me now? Acts chapter 10. And look at verse number 34 and 35. Acts chapter 10. So now when it comes to the plan of salvation. God is not a respecter of person. Acts 10, 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive God is no respecter of persons. You see that there? But in every nation, he that feared him and worked righteousness is accepted with him. And so when it comes to salvation, God is not a respecter of person. And not a, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew, a Gentile, male or female, God are free. When it comes to the plan of salvation, God is no respecter of person. When it comes to judgment, as we talked about, God is not going to be a respecter of person. Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans, Romans 2, forgive me. I want you to go to Romans 2. We'll wrap this up because I know you may have other questions. So I want to make sure we get this because I'm telling you, we're living in a world where people think because God distributes gifts in different ways that he's a respecter of persons. God handing out gifts to different people and his graces does not make him a respecter of person because he may give a person a different gift than he gives me. In Romans chapter 2, when it comes to judgment, we have to understand, he's not going to be a respecter of person. In Romans chapter 2 and verse number 10, Paul says this, 
but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respecter of persons with God. The context of this is judgment. In Romans chapter 1, he's saying he's going to judge the Jews. In Romans chapter 2, he's going to judge the Gentiles. And so there, when it comes to God's judgment, there's not going to be a respecter of persons. Now, with us understanding that, let me say this. When it comes to how we treat one another in the church, when it comes to God's law, there should not be any respecter of persons. Okay, go to Colossians, if you'd be so kind. Go to Colossians chapter number... Matter of fact, let's go to Galatians first. Let's go to Galatians. Go to Galatians 2. I want to show you this. Go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. So our attitude in the church can't be a respecter of persons when it comes to what God's law says. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 6, and this is how Paul felt about it. Paul said, but of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, Paul said, it made no matter to me. God accepted no, accepts no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. You see his attitude? His attitude is, I don't care who they are or who people think they are. He says, when it comes to God's law, when it comes to right and wrong, his attitude is, I'm not a respecter of person. So when you go back up to verse 5, you'll see here, go back to Galatians 2, 5. He says, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So whoever it was that was coming into the churches of Galatia that was propagating this false doctrine, teaching against God's law, what Paul says is, I didn't give him a space for an hour. He says, God is not a respecter of person when it comes to his law. And Paul says, nor am I a respecter of persons. And you go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. This is our attitude when it comes to God's law in the church. Our attitude is, you cannot be a respecter of person. Ephesians chapter 6. Look with me in verse number 8 and verse number 9. Ephesians 6, 8 and 9. Paul says, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord whether he be bond or free. And you masters, do the same thing unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So the idea here is you might be rich, you may have people that are under you, you may have people that you have authority over, but what he says is you treat them right. Because when it comes to judgment, you have a master. And God is going to judge you based upon his law of how you treat other people. There is no respecter of person. Go to James. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. We're dealing with how can God be no respecter of person and give gifts to his children. We're going to show you something here because uh, it has nothing to do with the gifts. God is not, has nothing to do with the gifts. God is not a respecter of persons when it comes to his law. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 9. Galatians 2 and verse number 9. Galatians 2 and, I'm sorry, James 2, forgive me. James 2, forgive me, saints. James chapter 2, and I want verse number 9. Very familiar passage of scripture to many of us here when it talks about favoritism. Uh, somebody in the congregation come in that's, that's wealthy, you know, or may have money. Uh, James chapter 2, let's start, if we could, at verse number, let's start with verse number 6. James 2 and 6. James said, but you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which you are called? If you fulfill the royal law, according to scripture, you shall love thy neighbor as thyself. He says you do well. But if you have respect to persons, he says you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. You see that? The, you know, the idea is, and I'm going to tell you, saying, you better be careful, I better be careful with this, thinking that just because somebody is wealthy, it means God is with them. That doesn't mean that. Just because somebody has money, it doesn't mean God is with them. And just because they don't have money, don't mean God's not with them. 
And so James is telling them, you be very careful with this respect of person thing based upon what you see, based upon the gifts that they might have in this life. So what do we conclude as I finish this up? There's some things I want you to conclude from what we, we talked about tonight. And that is, God doesn't want his law to be applied differently because of somebody's status in society. Okay? God is not a respecter of person when it comes to his law. It's the same law for everybody. It applies to everybody. Sin is sin for everybody. Okay? Secondly, salvation is for everybody. That's what we just talked about tonight. God is not a respecter of person when it comes to his salvation. Whether you're born free, Jew or Gentile, salvation is for everything, uh, for everybody. And so, and thirdly, none of this respect of person has anything to do with how God distributes his grace. That's what I want us to see. God can give his gifts and distribute them any way he wants to and still be God and still be good. However, he chooses to distribute his gifts. You know, the idea is, you know, if, if you, the president of the United States, he got kids or, or a county judge uh, who has kids. Now, when it comes to the law, the president and the county judge, they need to distribute the law equally. But just because the county judge goes home and give his kids gifts don't mean he has to give everybody a gift. I want to make sure we get that. He doesn't have to because he's a county judge of every child in his county. Doesn't mean he has to give every child in his county the same gift. And we need to understand it. And, it, and, and it's the same way with God. God can distribute, and he does, his gifts any way he so chooses. One more thing I want to, I want to show. Go to Romans 12. And this is what I want us to understand. Don't let the gift become a distraction. See, this is why Joseph got thrown into a pit. Because the father gave him a gift and the other brothers didn't like it. The father can distribute his gifts any way he wants to distribute his gift. And in the church, we all have different gifts, different talents. God may answer my prayer one way and not answer your prayer the same way. He may heal me from sickness and heal you not from sickness. He may heal my child and he may not heal your child. But that doesn't mean God has shown favoritism because he knows how to hand out his gifts. Romans 12. Romans 12. Romans 12. And I want you to look at me in verse number 3. I'm going to teach a lesson tomorrow morning at the congregation at, uh, at, at Goose Creek about, about the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure we see some things about the Lord and, and, and understand that he's always there. And he has a purpose for why he does what he does. He's always there. And everything he allows to happen in our life, he has a purpose for it. And we need to understand that. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 3. Look at this, Romans 12, look at verse 3. Now this is Paul writing to Christians. He said, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as, get this, as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. Do y'all see that? God can determine how to distribute his gifts. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member one of another. Having then gifts, get this, differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorted on exhortation, he that give it, let him do it with simplicity. He that rule it with diligence. He that show in mercy with cheerfulness. Y'all see that? So what he's saying is, you use your gift. Don't be jealous of somebody else's gift. Don't think that your gift that you have means nothing to the church. Just use your gift and don't be jealous of somebody else's gift. Covet the best gift, and you know that is love. 
Understand that everybody who has a gift, if God blesses this person with this and that person with that, I shouldn't be jealous. Just understand we're working together. That's what that's the mindset. Why would I be jealous? And so God is not a respecter of person. God can show mercy to whom he wants to show mercy. Go back to Romans 9. I said one more, but Romans, I'm going to show you Romans 9. Real quick, Romans 9. Because I'm going to tell you, a lot of people shake a fist at God because they see God handing out his, his grace in different ways. And grace is a scandal for a lot of people. It's a scandal. It's a scandal for that boy in Luke chapter 15 when Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal son. He doesn't think that that boy deserved that gift of grace. And so it's a scandal for him because, Father, you're distributing your grace to him and he don't deserve it. Or he's getting more than me. And that's the wrong attitude. And God is not a respecter of person. When it talks about God being no respecter of person, it's talking about when it comes to his laws. Now, in Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 9, look with me, start verse 6. Romans 9, 6. Paul is talking about God's righteousness, and he's talking about God's mercy. He said, not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall your seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that call it. That's what I'm going to deal with tomorrow. It is. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now listen, now listen to the question Paul poses in Romans 9, 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? He says, God forbid it. For said, he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture said unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. That's why God gives us all gifts, for his glory. His glory. It's not favoritism. If God gives me something different than he gives you, whatever he gives, you have to understand it's for his glory. Therefore, have he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will harden it. Thou will say then unto me, why did he yet find fault? For who had resisted his will? He said, nay, but oh man, who are you that reply against God? Shall the thing form say to he that him that formed it, why have you made me thus? Had not the powder power over the clay or the same lump to make one vessel on the honor and another on the dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessel of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of the glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory? Even us whom he had called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So as I close this question tonight, saints and friends, don't let the gift become a distraction. Don't let the gifts become a distraction. God is not a respectful person when it comes to his law, but he don't have to give everybody the same gift. Any other Bible question, comment, or thought? Uh, brother Green, go ahead, my brother. Well, um, I have a comment, and then I also have a question as well. And um, as far as uh, what you were talking about, you know, distributing the gifts, the scripture that came into my mind was uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses uh, 4 through 11. If you don't mind, Brother Stevenson, could you read those for me? Because my eyes are kind of blurry right now. Right. And it's the Holy Spirit, how he distributed spiritual gifts. He said, now there are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. There are the differences of administration, but the same Lord. There are diversity of operation, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with him. 
For the one is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom, another the word of knowledge, the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another divers kind of tongue, to another interpretation of tongues. But all these work it, that one and the self same Spirit dividing to every man severally, how does he do it? As he will. That's the key. The Spirit gave these miraculous gifts to people, individuals, as he will. And you and I need to be satisfied with that. Just because somebody is blessed with more than I have physically in the, in the physical realm, it ought not cause me to look at God and say he's a respecter of person. I want you to understand some brothers, and I know you have another thing you want to add that, Brother Green, but I want to say this while the thought is in my mind. If God had to give everybody the same gift, understand something. There would be no male, no female. There'd be no weak. There'd be no strong. There'd be no rich. There'd be no poor. If God had to give everybody the same gift, it's ridiculous. And so God does not have to give everybody the same grace or the same gift. And just because he doesn't, it doesn't mean he's a respectful person. Brother Green. Yes, sir. I just want to add to that before I ask my question. Because as you were teaching this, I was thinking that, you know, God distributes those gifts the way he sees because he knows. He knows, you know, who would be good at this gift, who would be, why? Because he created it. So he would know exactly what gift to give a person because he knows how he created or how he made that person. So I just wanted to add that in great lesson. My question is this, I was having a conversation with uh, my wife earlier today and the subject came up about anointing with oil. And she was telling me how, you know, her sister has this thing to where she'll go to somebody's house and anoint it with oil or anoint a person with oil and so on and so forth. So that's my question. What does the Bible teach that's for us today when it comes to this anointing with oil? There is no anointing oil. Uh, that I'd like to know where they get the oil from. First of all, that's that's first and foremost. Where do you what what, what makes the oil that they have uh, a, a holy oil? What makes it holy? And secondly, we have to understand that when the Bible used oil, it was for medicinal purposes. Uh, when you look at like Luke chapter ten, Luke chapter ten, and you look at the story of the Good Samaritan. Where the Levite and the in the uh, the publican look at here Luke chapter ten and look at this the, the story of the, the the Good Samaritan where you had a lawyer stood up tempting Jesus saying Master what should I do in here eternal life and then you'll notice that in verse thirty of Luke ten a certain man went down from Jerusalem Jericho fell among the thieves which stripped him of his raiment wounded him departed leaving him dead. And there came down a certain priest and who passed by on the other side. And in verse 32, a Levite came and looked on him, passed by on the other side. But the Samaritan, verse 33, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, had compassion on him. Went to him, bound up his wound. Now notice what he did. Pouring in oil and wine. See, oil was a mess. Whatever the oil was that they poured in the wound. To talk about anointing people like Samuel anointed David uh, with that oil based upon an oil that had to be made by a certain type of uh, chemicals under the law of Moses. I'm going to find that scripture as I'm thinking about this. There was a certain oil that had to be made under the law of Moses. And if anybody tried to make something like that, they would die. And so there is no body today that are priests and priestesses in the physical that has some type of oil that they putting on your head and anointing you and causing you to be healed. Okay? And causing you to be and causing you to be healed. And so we just have to understand that the oil was always it was medicinal. Even when you look at James, we don't have to get into that tonight, but even when you look at James 5, when you talk about the elders, there in James chapter 5. The oil there 
has nothing <clears throat> to do with the spiritual sickness of an individual. That also is dealing with the physical sickness that that individual has in James chapter 5. So, I mean, what wound are they pouring oil in? What kind of oil are they are they rubbing on you? Or where are they putting it to heal you? And so it, it's just ridiculous all the way around, but it's denominationalism, and it, it only happens among those who are not students of the Bible, and that'll just fall for anything. The Peter Popoff movement, you know, anointing oil, pay for stuff through the mail, or holy water. What makes the water holy? You know, that kind of foolishness is all that is, Brother Green. Uh, Brother, Brother Coffee. Uh, great lesson, Brother Henry. Um, one of the things that that I try to share with, with individuals is we have, and I say it this way, we have to deal with the hand that we're dealt to where, you know, we need to spend more time trying to really understand the gift that God gave us instead of me being more concerned about what Brother Henry has and this type of thing. You know, it's just unfortunate that you know, you have this jealousy or not being mature in the confidence in, in what you're good at. And, and then you begin to have this this rift between others because they are they are good at certain things. And even the things that they're weak, you know, for those that are wise would, would try to uh, approve upon the things that they're weak upon. So there can be a, a consistent balance in, in your life and as far as being a servant. But I think this is important because... Um, this was something that I, you know, I don't really want to go off course that, that I learned at a young age to where I had no business being jealous of another man and definitely not another woman, but I spent a lot of my time trying to figure out who I was and trying to perfect what I enjoyed within myself. And then when I came into church, it just, it, it edifies it more because it didn't change because these gifts was given to all of us at birth as, as you taught us tonight, as God will to give us and so it really complements the individual when we can spend the time really perfecting that that craft and having confidence within that not arrogance not thinking you better than one because i also say you have the gift of teaching you have the gift of, of, of caring for others when i came to goose, goose creek the first time you doing books and all and i'm like where's everybody else but you didn't do it with 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 the attitude that you know where's everybody else to help me you did it because you love the lord and, and you want to make sure things are in order so again you learn from others but that doesn't mean that I have to be jealous of another man or another person because he does things well. We can learn from that, is my comment. God oh, bless you, brother. And you know, that's exactly what Paul is dealing with in 1 Corinthians. When we look at that chapter 12, as, as Brother Green brought up, and that's why he said, because remember, they thought that speaking in tongues was the deal, man. And if you could speak in tongues, man, they thought that was the gift, man. I can speak in tongues. But Paul has to deal with them in that context. He said, no, you need to covet the most earnest gift. And then he gets into chapter 13 talking about love. You know, that's what it is. The gifts is to build and to edify the body. Everybody's not the eye. Everybody's not the ear. Everybody's not the hand. You know, everybody's not the foot. But we all need each other. That's the point. The gifts is for the building of the body. And as you said, there is no room for arrogancy. And so, and, to, and really at the end of the day, to whom much is given, much is expected. I mean, you, you bring up this teaching thing, and that's true, but remember James 3, 1, those who teach are going to be held in greater condemnation. So there's a lot of people who want the gifts, but they want them for the wrong reason. We'll talk about this tomorrow morning, too, to the Saints at Goose Street. They, they, they want the gifts, but they want them for the wrong reason. And this is why sometimes when we pray and ask God for things, we don't get them. Because our motives for why we want them is not to build up the body, not to glorify God, but to vaunt ourselves. And we got to be very careful with that in the body. Uh, well, I found Exodus 30. I want you to go back to this anointing oil. Uh, when they did have an oil, uh, perhaps that Sam Samuel used to go anoint David. It wasn't just told any kind of oil. Samuel was a, was a priest. Somebody heard it. Brother Donald got it. All right. That, that the shot. Hey, read it for me, Brother Donald. That's, that's, uh, he's sharp. Go to Exodus. Go ahead, Brother. Read Exodus 34, Brother Donald. He's already got it. Okay. Exodus chapter 30. I'll begin at verse 23. I take thou also unto the principal spices of pure myrrh, five hundred shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half of such, even two hundred and fifty shekels, and of sweet calamus, two hundred and fifty shekels, and of cassia, five hundred shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of all olive and hen, 
and thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apocrypy. I that one. It shall be a holy anointing oil. And thou shalt anoint the tabernacle of the congregation therewith, and the ark of the testimony, and the tables of all his vessels, and the candlestick of his vessels, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his vessels, and the lover of his foot. And thou shalt sanctify them, that they may be most holy. Whatsoever toucheth them shall be holy. Well, keep reading, brother, because I want you to read down. I want you to read down to, uh, what'd you read down to? Uh, I'm at verse 30. I'll I want you to read down, because down, I want you to see. I want you to read down to verse 32 for me, because I want you to see. Maybe I read down to verse 33 for me, because it's, I, want the, I want you to hear what the Lord said about this oil. Read down to verse 33. And thou shalt anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt speak unto them. The children of Israel saying, This shall be an holy anointing all unto me throughout your generations. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured, neither shall you make any other like it after the composition of it. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. Whosoever compounded any like it, or whosoever put it, any of it upon a stranger, shall even be cut off from his people. Amen. You see that? And so you can't just put this on anybody you want to choose to put it on, even when they have the anointing oil. God would have to tell you, okay, this is how it's to be used and, and when to use it. Just something, wasn't something you just go do on, 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 on your own and just anoint and just pour it everywhere. Just put it on anybody's flesh, which is what they advocate today in the, in the denominational world. So thank you for that read, my brother. Yeah. And that word there is an apothecary. You know, and the, an apothecary is the place where they make perfumes. That's actually what that is. So that, that word there, thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It's the people that makes the perfumes uh, that put it together, the art of the apothecary. Yeah. And so thank you, Brother Donald. Wonderful, wonderful, fine, and wonderful read. Anybody have any other Bible questions? Any other Bible questions? Any other Bible questions? All right, so while we're here tonight, nobody has anything. All right, well, thank you all. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Oh, Sister Hernandez, I see your mic's on mute. Go ahead. I just want to say about a, I forgot the scripture, but it says that the, the prayers or the elders and the oil will save you. I have to get a scripture, but you have to do something like, like with the oil that when they burn yeah, James, yeah, James 5 is where that's at. James chapter 5. But it, it's not if it, it not referring to uh, that oil that James 5 is uh, talking about. Is, is the physical part too? Yes. Yeah, because he's dealing with in James 5. He's not, he's dealing with, with physical, a physical sickness that this individual has in James chapter 5. He, he's dealing with a physical sickness in James chapter 5. And so when you're sick, you can call for the elders of the church, is what he deals with there, the elders, you know, shepherds, hence shepherds, take care of the sheep. And if you have uh, sheep that are sick, you don't need medicine. Uh, the idea was the shepherds would, would provide what's needed and they would, they would pray uh, with the individuals. And uh, if now, now, the key in there, if they committed sin, you know how I know he's not talking about a spiritual sickness? Because he's talking about if they committed sins, they will be lifted up. If they committed sins, they would be lifted up. And so if they were talking about spiritual sickness, he wouldn't have to use the word if they committed sins. Because they are spiritually sick if he's dealing with sins. And so what happens is, this is why church government is so important. When you have members who are sick, they should let the church know. And if you have leadership elders there, they pray with you, pray for you, and make sure that if there's medicines you need that we can help with, then we'll, we'll pray with you and, and get the medicines uh, that, that's needed to, to, to help you with, with the wounds or what, what pains you may be going through in your life, okay? And so I, that's what James 5 is talking about. Uh, in James chapter 5 and the verse, I think it's 14 and 15, my sister. 14 and 15. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right, uh, Brother Donald? But just a, a quick introduction. And uh, uh, my cousin, Daryl, Daryl Sr., is on with us, and he's uh, a part of our study tonight and just wanted to welcome, here, uh, welcome him uh, to our study. And if there's any questions or concerns, uh, I pray that my cousin would actually uh, ask his questions or make his comments. Hey, man, so glad to have you on, and uh, yeah, really appreciate Thank you. that. Yeah, so yeah. glad to have you a part of these studies. Yeah, you yeah, come I, back at any time. Yeah, you, you have any questions? Again, we're not on here to embarrass anybody. Uh, this is an open uh, discussion, and just, all I'm gonna ask you is just hold us accountable to give you book, chapter, and verse, uh, rightly divided from God's word about any question uh, that you might have. Okay, and thank you for coming on tonight. Anybody else? You have any questions? I appreciate about? it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have any question? Any Bible question? Any Bible question? All right, well, let me just say this. You know, all the things that we talked about tonight will do us no good if you're not a Christian. Make sure you understand that. That's the most important thing. Tomorrow's not promise. Uh, the scripture tells us yeah, today if you hear his voice. Today if you hear his voice. And so you need to, you need to answer the call, you know, because, again, tomorrow's not promise. Uh, all of us, if you're going to be saved, you got to be in Christ. Uh, good people don't go to heaven. I'll say this again. Good people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. There's a lot of good people in the world as far as, you know, they, they're kind, they, they're, they're nice, uh, they're not murderers, you know, thieves. If you walk next door and want to borrow something from them, they, they, they're they people that would give it to you out of the kindness and the goodness of their heart. Uh, but the truth of the matter is the scripture teaches us there is none that's good, no, not one. Uh, we need to be saved. you got to be born again. Uh, Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, 3 through 5, except a man be born again. He cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, you hear words like that, and it ought to cause us to ask, well, what do I need to do to be born again? What does that mean, born again? Well, we have to understand the first sin we committed, we died. The first sin you and I committed, we died. How did we die? We died to God. How did we die? We died spiritually. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that God told Adam and Eve, the day you eat of this tree, he says, you will surely die. The day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. But the Bible goes on also to say Adam lived to be 930 years old. So how could that be? The day he ate, the day he died, but yet he still went on to live to be 930. How did he die? If God said the day he ate, he was going to die. He died spiritually because sin separates you from God. And so the first sin you committed, I committed, we died. We were dead to God. There's a lot of dead people walking around today, eating chicken, celebrating Memorial Weekend, dead dead to God because they hadn't been born again. So what do you have to do to be born again? You need to hear the gospel. Hear that Jesus died, buried, rose again from the third day for your sin. But you're not saying just because you hear it, you got to believe that. The Bible says Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God for he that come to him must believe that he is and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. But are you saying just because you believe Jesus is the son of God? Absolutely not. The Bible tells us in James chapter 2 that even the demons believe that he's the son of God. But there won't be one demon in heaven because with belief comes repentance. you got to be willing to repent. Once you believe that you're a sinner, that Jesus died for your sin, you got to be willing to repent of your sins. Repentance is a change of mind which leads to a change of action. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you, nay, but you all likewise repent, you're going to all likewise perish. And then once you have that change of mind, you have to confess that you believe Jesus is Lord with your mouth. You've got to confess him as Lord. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. That's the confession, not your sins. I'm confessing that he's Lord, that he is the only way, that salvation is no, and no other but Jesus. Acts chapter 4, <clears throat> verse number 12. No other name. And then be willing to get baptized in water by a male member of the Lord's church. That's the only plan of salvation. Only one way to be born again. You and I can't be born again different than the Apostle Paul, the man who wrote the majority of the Bible. Paul had to be baptized by a male member of the Lord's church. I don't understand how people think they can become a Christian different than the Apostle Paul, the man who wrote the majority of the New Testament. He had to be baptized by a male member of the church. 
and the Lord added him to the people of God, as we see in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 36 all the way to 47. 3,000 people got baptized the same day. After hearing, believing, repenting, they got baptized. In Acts 2, 47, the Lord added them to the church, the people of God you can read about in the Bible. If you didn't obey that two post, that plan of salvation, you're not saved. A lot of people say, well, I've been baptized before. No, but you can't be taught wrong and baptized right. You cannot be baptized right and be a member of a denominational church. Impossible. Impossible. Can't be baptized and I'm a Catholic Christian, Methodist Christian. I go to the Baptist church, the Methodist church. I'm Catholic. I'm Presbyterian. All these are names you don't even see in the Bible. How do you become a Presbyterian? How do you become a Baptist, a Methodist Christian? None of that's in the Bible. You cannot pick up the Bible and ever become a compound Christian. Impossible. And so if you're calling yourself anything other than a Christian, if you had not obeyed what the apostles obeyed, then you're not saved. It don't matter if you believe you're saved or you think you're saved. What matters is, what does the Bible say? I've been there. Thought I was saved when I wasn't saved. And I had to be honest. Is this what I did to become a Christian? Did I do and did I believe what Paul believed when he got into the water? Because you can't be taught wrong and baptized right. And so that's the plan. We're going to assist you in any way. We'll put you in contact with somebody. I don't know where everybody lives. But we'll do our, make every effort that we can to do our due diligence to make sure that you get the right man uh, in your place, in your presence, to baptize you in water tonight. We baptize on any day that any of the why. And we baptize at any time of the day. Okay, and so we can help you in that way. We'd love to do that. Are there any uh, prayer requests or any questions anybody have about anything I've said tonight? Any prayer requests? Any questions about anything that I have said on tonight? All right. If not, then, well, any, uh, Sister Hernandez, I see your hand. I just want to thank God for uh, your prayer for my kids. Uh, my daughter has passed the the exam in the university, and she very thankful for all your prayer, you know, to thank you. Amen. Praise God. That's good news, our sister. She passed her exams for the university. All right. Well, God is good, and that's good. When things happen, we pray to God, and he answered the way we desire. We want to give him thanks for it, so we definitely do that. Uh, Brother Donald, I see your hand, my brother. Yes, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the saints also for the prayers lifted up for my brother Joe. I had uh, an opportunity to see and visit with him today, and he's doing so much better. He's actually uh, trying to walk, uh, still not talking, but moving, smiling, and uh, he's doing so much better. Thank you all so much for the prayers and lifting up the family. Man, God, God is good. good. Hey, man, brother Donald, that's good news. Our brother Joe, wonderful. And, uh, yeah, we'll just keep praying, brother, God's will. We know at the end of the day who's in control. Again, we want to give him thanks when we see progress uh, and prayers answered uh, according to our desire, but most of all, his will. Anything else anybody else has? All right. Yeah. Um, okay, go ahead, uh, brother Mike. Um, we had looked at, well, I looked at care results on his cancer. They said the brain ain't got no more cancer in his brain. They're just going to keep looking at his spine. So they said he's supposed to be coming home the first or maybe four days after that because they're giving him a new sign of chemo. Oh, boy, boy, boy. I will go. Yes. yes I will go. Wow. And that's, that's, boy, that's awesome. Yeah, praise his name. That's our God, saints. I told the saints a few weeks ago, don't pray for me if you don't believe God can answer. If we don't believe that God can do what we're asking him to do, I'm talking about that tomorrow too. If you don't believe that God can do what we ask him, then don't pray. You know, just, just leave it at that. Don't pray. But God is able. Now, maybe he will, maybe he won't, but he able. Now, I want to make sure we all get that. He's able. Thank you, brother Mike, for that report. Thank you. Uh, brother Donald? Oh, one more thing, and I, I know, my brother, you're aware that, uh, uh, you know, when we have a church home, that's where we go in the first day of the week to worship. And and with the blessings of the saint, we have our sister Hernandez here with us. Uh, and uh, she's really been a great inspiration 
And uh, as we journey through, we will be going to see Brother Roseanne, Brother Javier tomorrow and worshiping a with a Will Clayton. So please pray for us for safe travel that we honor God if he allows us to see uh, the first day of the week and uh, to continue to pray for my sister because she is a great inspiration. Amen. God bless you, brother. Now, I definitely will, my brother. Keep you all in prayer uh, for safe travel and thanks for the encouragement and edification that we give one to another, my brother. God bless y'all and the great work that you're doing. Anybody else? Anybody else, saints? Okay, if not, uh, Brother Coffee, you mind taking us up, closing us out, brother, in a word of prayer tonight? I certainly will. Let us, <clears throat> let us pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for another day and for another opportunity, Father, to gather together with the saints. We thank you, Father, for your inspired word. We thank you, Father, for your manservant, Father, which taught us diligently, Father, according to the scriptures. We thank you, Father, for the simplicity of the things in which we heard tonight. We pray, Father, that the things that we heard, Father, we will hide them in our hearts and that we will put the things to work, Father, realizing that you are no respecter of person, that you have gifted us all different, that the gifts that you have given us, Father, are to edify one to another, that you will be pleased with us as we work through the things that uh, you have assigned us to do according to your will. We thank you, Father, for all the praise reports tonight that you have heard tonight from, from Brother Donald, for his brother. We thank you, Father, for our, our brother, uh, Mr. Donald Sr. We thank you, Father, for his presence. We pray, Father, that for those that are speaking into his life, Father, we just pray that one day that he would uh, come to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ according to the pattern that we see in the scripture, according to what was spoken by Brother Stephen to tonight, how a sinner must be saved. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, Mikhail, Father, who is doing so much better. We thank you, Father, for his parents who continue to pray for him and to continue to fight a good fight of faith. We thank you, Father, for the awesome God that we, that we serve. We thank you, Father, for your long suffering, that you've given us an opportunity to hear the gospel and to believe that you have now added us to the church because we have obeyed that form of teaching that we have been taught tonight. So be with us, Father, as we um, go and sleep and slumber throughout this night, and also be with Brother uh, Donald and, and Sister Hernandez as they uh, go about on these roads tomorrow, Father, with your will, that you will protect them, that they will continue to worship you in spirit and in truth, that we all should do tomorrow on the Lord's day. So, Father, be with us, Father, tonight as we sleep and slumber. And Father, if there's anything that I've forgotten, Father, we just pray that you would bless those that uh, the hearts may be uh, yearning for certain requests for us, their families, or even their, their loved ones, that you would give us rest and peace tonight. And if you give us another opportunity to praise your name tomorrow on the Lord's day, that we would go with a ready mind to only praise you in spirit and in truth. So we thank you for this opportunity of prayer. Forgive us, the Lord, of our sins and cleanse us, Father, from all unrighteousness. So we thank you. We ask these blessings in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Coffee. Love you, Saints. The love of God. Remember, our next study is going to be on Brother Green's Zoom page uh, this coming Monday. I know it's Memorial Day. We're good, Brother Green. Monday. Okay, Monday, and we're in Matthew chapter twenty, uh, chapter twenty-six. Okay, Matthew twenty-six, Saints. So be studying that uh, for this coming Monday. Love you all. The love of God, and y'all have a great night and a great Lord's Day. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bless y'all. Be safe, Brother Donald, Sister Valerie, Sister Hernandez. Y'all take care. I'm a big promise. Hey, Brother Amy. Thank you, Brother. Have a good night. Bye.